Well, thank you so very, very much. Got the great, great pleasure to now introduce Jay Vinto. Jay is Charles Steele Professor of History at Yale University. He is the author of Sites of Memory, Sites of Mourning, The Great War in European Cultural History, a book Eric told us so much about and um, encouraged us to read. Remembering War is another book of Jay and also Dreams of Peace and Freedom. Together with Antoine Prost, he co-authored the book René Cassin et les droits de l'homme, Le projet d'une génération. This book is being translated, I think, as we speak. Today, Jay will be talking about what he calls the memory boom in relation to human rights. A very, very warm welcome to Jay Winter. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, and I too, I uh, want to say that it is an, an honor to be here, uh, in part uh, to uh, remember Eric Hobsbawm. Um, I think the important thing to, to do uh, here is to reflect a little bit uh, on where we are and who we are in doing it. We are in a site of memory. And I think in many respects what we have to understand uh, in direct continuation of what Donald Sassoon uh, has uh, shown us uh, is that uh, what I would like to call the memory boom is a, a restatement of sacred themes. And I'd like to make a bold claim. I'd like to make a claim that we are in a tent that could be a revival meeting. It could be a religious a pilgrimage. And to a degree, the study of memory, the performance of memory, is a pilgrimage to the past. And I want to suggest that art galleries, museums, sites of memory, are the cathedrals of the 21st century. They are the places where sacred questions are posed, as in the photograph we just showed, and occasionally answered symbolically, eternal questions about sacrifice, about death, about love, about loyalty, betrayal, devotion, suffering. Those religious images that Donald Sassoon showed of, of Willy Brandt on his knees at the edge of the Jewish ghetto in Warsaw, on his knees in a Catholic country, uh, asking forgiveness for his nation. These are moments when sites of memory reconfigure religious questions that are less and less posed in the churches once inhabited by our societies. In many parts of the world, more people go to art galleries and museums than go to churches. Now, this is true in part of the world only, not all, uh, in all parts of the world. On a Sunday not long ago, I passed Trinity Anglican Church in Lambeth just after having visited the nearby Imperial War Museum in London and was struck by the contrast in numbers. And I think we who work in history, especially history outside of the universities, what we call public history, have taken on a more important social role than ever before. That is why memory understood as history seen through affect is an industry today. It's a place where many people make their income and make a substantial income at that. Memory understood as narratives about the past, has taken on a more important social role than ever before. I think we speak to questions of vital importance to millions within and indeed mostly outside of the academy, and we have to recognize the fact that it isn't the internet in contradistinction to one of the earlier speakers or the capacity of memory chips to retrieve which has created a memory boom. These technical devices have exponentially increased the significance of a phenomenon that was already in motion before the internet revolution. Now, while secularization has taken its toll on our churches, I believe that the sacred has not vanished from our field of vision. My position is that the sacred has simply moved out of the churches and inhabits other public spaces, including this one. Museums, battlefields, archives, galleries, sites of significance, the Cenotaph in London, there are many others we can refer to are among them. 
And if we accept this assumption, then I think we can see that part of the origins and power of what I call the memory boom relate to fundamental changes in the ways in which societies configure sacred questions. I think we should all recognize that there has been an extraordinary increase in the demand for symbols of our common past over the last 50 years. That memory boom, which I think can be dated from the 1960s and 1970s, is overdetermined. Let me just give you a couple of instances of how we can understand this phenomenon that we all share and that I believe this event is a perfect example of. The memory boom arose at a time when the proportion of the young adult population going to higher education rose exponentially. Between 1960 and 1990, there was more than a threefold increase in the cohort, the age cohort, leaving school, going to higher education. And that was true throughout Europe and in North America. It is not linked uh, to a particular country, uh, but to an entire area. This educated population had at its disposal new technologies of storage the internet doesn't surprise me, since I'm old enough to know about Betamax, there's another forgotten phrase, or VHS. Computers built on storage retrieval uh, uh, that had already been there. That the audio cassette is a, is a phenomenon of, uh, of my university years. The video cassette is, is a, a phenomenon of the first years of my teaching, and now I've been teaching for 43 years. Now, I think there is an important point, though, about the technology. It is certainly there, but there's something much more important that I want to refer to today. And that is that the memory boom has focused on many, many subjects, but at its core are the victims of war. The Holocaust is part of this story, but by no means the entirety of it. I want to suggest that between the 1960s and in the 1990s, there has been a sea change in opinion about war that has delegitimated it. And I do want to follow Donald's lead and say, can we not understand why it was necessary? Can't we see, perhaps appreciate, if not support, why it was that Blair and Bush had to invent the weapons of mass destruction in order to get populations to agree for a moment to do what it was they were got, wanted to do for other reasons? It is because the, the recourse to war is not now a legitimate act. And I think it is important to recognize that in parts of the world, the story is different. But in Western Europe in particular, and to a degree that may be surprising in parts of the United States, war has changed in such a way as to lose its natural appeal as an extension of politics. Clausewitz is dead. War was politics as other means. Now it is an invitation to create a mountain of corpses. And it is the construction of the category of the, of the victim and the witness, which I would like to suggest is in, at, the central, uh, at the center of our understanding of the memory boom of the last uh, uh, 50 or 60 years. Now, at the same time as there has been a change in normative thinking about war, the institutions of violence themselves have changed. Now we are in a field where we might describe war as asymmetric in which the boundaries between civilian and military targets are completely unclear. Who could see Syria in any other way than that everyone is a victim and everyone is a target? And I think in many respects, this shift towards recognizing that war has victims that incorporate everyone who is engaged in it is, uh, extends to soldiers as well. The category of post-traumatic stress disorder is a f part of the phenomenon of the memory boom. In 1980, it became a diagnosis a condition with treatment available. And that meant that soldiers themselves were part of the victims of the institutions of war uh, that they, uh, they waged uh, uh, as well. Now, I think in many respects, we can see that the memory business is booming. And it coincides with the appearance of a mass movement located all over the world of popular support for human rights. My final point in my rem remarks today is I want to link the memory boom, the extraordinary uh, uh, spread of recognition of the abomination of war and the human rights movement from the 1970s on. I believe that the memory boom has had important and positive consequences. I am not an advocate of forgetting. I believe that focusing on the victims of war was what attention to the Holocaust insisted on. And once that turn in sensibility came, focusing on soldiers as victims of war, men and women who carry for a lifetime their physical and psycho psychological wounds, was a natural step. 
And this turn away from the heroic story of war accompanied this sea change in public attitudes to war itself. It lost its naturalness, and though it still carries a charge, especially for some young men on the internet, the European reaction to the Iraq war in 2003 shows that something had changed, something significant in the way we look at war. Where have all the soldiers gone is not only a troubadour's ballot, but a real question when surveying European developments in particular. Defense expenditure throughout Europe and the United States is at lower than one third of its 1980 levels. This is a massive shift in public investment in killing. And that is why I believe that Bush and Blair calculated that they had to lie about something monstrous in order to get public's op opinion to move away from a slow and steady sea change of opinion about war. The memory boom, in my view, is at the heart of the European human rights revolution. And I, too, believe that if uh, there are a series of people who ought to join uh, the whoever it will be uh, to receive the Nobel Peace Prize on the 10th of December in Oslo, uh, it ought to be those who built the European Convention on Human Rights in the post-Second World War period. Now, among them was the man whose biography I've just written, René Cassin. He's not a household name here, but he's a man who did something extraordinary. He believed that the only way in which there can be a European uh, peace is that there would be constructed a convention on human rights that put a higher law above that of national law. That is to say, states had to sacrifice some of their sovereignty in order to avoid the catastrophes of the two world wars. And that decision to do so, that decision to do so was based upon memory. I put it to you that memory is a human right and that the very act of constructing a human rights agenda for Europe and elsewhere in the world is an act of commemoration. It's an act of stating that the only way in which the European project can deserve the Nobel Prize that it is about to receive in December is by unpacking the points of conflict that are still there. Let us not forget that Srebrenica is still a contested site. It is not possible for people to construct a memorial there because they were literally within, uh, within feet of the families of those who were involved in the crime. There are places on the continent in which peacemaking is a relatively new phenomenon. Think about this astonishing development, that in Ireland there will be a celebration of the centenary of the First World War and the rising of 1916 at the same time and by people who a few years ago would have happily strangled each other. Now, I think the, the significance I want to make is that symbolic sites are the moral compasses of our contemporary social order. And in Europe, that social order has had a form, a European form that moves away from war. The fact that British politicians from, from Churchill on, Donald's is ap absolutely right, uh, have, shall we say, an ambivalent attitude towards being part of the European uh, experiment uh, should not let us uh, deny the significance of the achievement that has occurred over the last 50 years. And all I want to do is to suggest very simply is that we should understand that the construction of memory as a moral act and its development over the entirety of the European continent is a profoundly pacifist phenomenon. The experience of war is the antechamber of the European experience. It is, of course, a bumpy ride to get into some other form of politics that, than has existed over the past 150 years. But just imagine how far we've come. In 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was signed in Paris, it was just a few feet from where Hitler, eight years earlier, had surveyed his new uh, regime to last for 1,000 years. And those universal principles, principles that are not international, but universal principles of human rights, provided an, in, an image of what going beyond the boundaries of a nation state have to be. My family uh, came from Poland and Russia, and uh, the survivors are the ones with whom I grew up. 
um, I am 67 now, and I'm astonished, absolutely astonished, when I go to France and I drive uh, across to Germany the way in the United States I would go from Connecticut to Massachusetts. It's, it's a phenomenon that I believe is a product of the memory boom. There are many other, of course, interests that has driven this forward, economic interests, ideological interests. But I'd like to, to say that the fundamental question of moving away from war is a moral question. And the human rights movement in this country, as well as elsewhere in the world, have taken moral questions that have, in some ways, moved out of the churches and put them into areas in which we can link remembering the violence of the past century with the construction of a better order for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you very much.